welcome back to the Foundations course of the No Man Left Behind Self-Paced Training. I'm Brett Clemmer, and I'm back here with Pat Morley, David Delk, and Charles Cooper. In the last session, uh, the Wide Deep Continuum, we talked about how important it is to figure out where men are spiritually so that we can more intentionally and effectively reach them with our discipleship efforts. We're about to begin this session, an all-inclusive ministry to men. Now, guys, I was wondering, could you share some of the things that have been most instrumental in your own personal spiritual growth? Well, I know for me, one of the things in our church life was uh, a couples group. We were involved with about five couples in our home, and uh, some of the men uh, made some poor choices, as men are known to do sometimes, and it really put their marriages in jeopardy, uh, two of the guys in particular, at almost the same time. And we had to get real with each other. We had to walk through some tough, tough issues, and I know for my wife and I, it caused us to reflect on our lives. Uh, but it also was such a blessing to be engaged with these other couples and, and really tackling some things that are hard things, and yet we helped each other walk through them through the grace of Christ. Mm -hmm. hmm. Well, you know, my first experience was to be in a small group with uh, one of the leaders in the church and his wife who kind of took an interest in me, uh, my wife and me, and put us into this small group. And uh, that's where I really began to flourish and learn the Word of God and draw connections to my everyday life. And uh, then the next thing I knew, I was in a uh, weekend seminar where I learned how to share my faith and actually led a person to Christ over the course of a weekend seminar. And so those are two tremendous early growth opportunities for me. And certainly I echo that, certainly the idea of small group, generally small group, but for me as a teacher of the small group, probably more so, because I always had a, or needed to be one step ahead of my students and needing to grow and to always be refreshed and growing in such a way that I could lead them. So that has been very instrumental to me. Yeah, I know for me, uh, it was working with a bunch of, of uh, middle school boys teaching a small group once again. And, uh, you know, you, like you said, you got to stay one step ahead. They're always asking questions that you don't expect. And so it really helped me, you know, really take a look at what I believed. And, you know, it's interesting there that, none of these things that we said were conventional men's ministry activities. And so that's why this next session is going to be so important. I think the all-inclusive ministry to men concept may be a paradigm shift for you as you're looking at how you reach and disciple men. So let's, let's go join David Delk as he presents the next session, an all-inclusive ministry to men. If you look in your workbooks for the session on an all-inclusive ministry to men, you'll see there's some questions there. Uh, with some blanks beside them and the first one says the number of men in my church and then the second one says the number of men in my men's ministry i'm wondering if there are some guys here who would tell us how they would fill in those blanks just off the top of your head how many men would you estimate are regularly worshiping at your church and and how many men would you estimate are in your men's ministry is there anybody here who could could tell us those numbers yeah Okay, so 300 men and 20 to 35 guys, all right? Yeah. I would say the men's ministry should be the same number as the men in your church. That's right. The men's ministry should be the same number as the men in your church. What, were your, what was your, uh, your thoughts, though, when you approached that question? How many of you would think of a different number between the number of men in your church and the number of men in your men's ministry? How many would have given me two different numbers? Okay, good. Um, and then some of you are thinking about this, the session that we're about to do in this all-inclusive ministry to men, and you're already saying, well, wait a minute, maybe it should be the same, particularly if you've actually seen the book No Man Left Behind. And so in this session on an all-inclusive ministry to men, as we look at the, continue to look at the foundations of the No Man Left Behind model and how to apply that in the life of our church, one of the things we're going to think about is this idea of an all-inclusive ministry to men. And you can see that the, the definition of an all-inclusive ministry to men is that it maximizes the kingdom potential of every interaction our church has with every man. It maximizes the kingdom potential of every interaction our church has with every man. And so, when we think about our men's ministry, what we really begin to realize is that every man in our church is in our men's ministry that the size of our men's ministry is identical to the number of men who attend our church. We have a ministry with every one of those men. It may be effective, it may be ineffective, but we have a ministry with every man who somehow has any interactions in the life of our church. 
tell you a story about how this idea uh, began to develop and germinate. I was doing a consulting weekend with a church in Atlanta, Georgia, and they told me a list of questions that they wanted me to answer. They were very organized. They had post-it paper with the questions on them, ready to write answers and dialogue about it. And I mean, it was, it was great. And so one of these questions was uh, that, that, that they said, you know, we have this incredible sports program. And they'd actually driven me by the church, and they had beautiful fields. I mean, it looked like, you know, Augusta National or something. I mean, just immaculate baseball fields, beautiful soccer fields. And so they said, all the people in our community want to play in our sports programs with their kids. It's sold out every year. And so we have all these kids from the neighborhoods, and their dads and moms are here, and their moms get to know our moms, and their dads get to know our dads. And then a lot of their kids will end up getting involved in things at the church, and you know, then their moms get connected, their dads get connected, and pretty soon they're attending church here, and, and then the, the moms and dads are in married a ministry classes and other things, and children's ministry, and, and the dads are becoming Christians, and they're starting to learn, and they're attending classes, and some of them are getting involved even in our leadership training. We've got guys that, are, that are, have become deacons and, and now serving as elders in our church, and these guys never come to our monthly Saturday morning breakfasts. Can you please help us solve this problem? Okay. So I stopped him for a second and I said, okay, this, I just want to make sure I understand the problem because you have to understand the problem before you can solve it. And so I said, um, basically what you're saying is that your church has men around it who don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And right now your church has a ministry that's connecting those men with Christian men, their wives with, with Christian women, their kids with Christian kids. It's engaging them. It's getting them connected into the life of the church so that they're becoming Christians, they're learning about spiritual leadership in their home, they're learning about spiritual leadership in the church, some of them even exercising that spiritual leadership in the church, all of them engaged, all of them learning and growing, and the problem exactly is... And of course the problem was they weren't, do they weren't doing it our way. They weren't doing it as part of our men's ministry. Well, this makes absolutely no sense. If I had it all to do over again, I, I didn't think fast enough on my feet. If I had it all to do over again, I would have said, look, I've got the perfect answer for you. Quit doing your Saturday morning br uh, breakfast. Go buy more land and build more ball fields. Because that's what God's using to transform men's lives. Right? So why in the world would you want to stop doing something like that or, or de-emphasize something like that in order to tell those guys, look, you need to come over here and you need to do our thing, which is a Saturday morning monthly breakfast. And so we began to dialogue with churches that were effectively discipling men, and we began to realize that many of them, maybe not even knowing it, many of them have what we now call an all-inclusive ministry to men. They recognize that any time their church interacts with a man, that that is an opportunity for discipleship. It doesn't matter if it's through the children's ministry. It doesn't matter if it's through the, the uh, couple's ministry. Uh, because they're being an usher in the worship band, the praise band, whatever it is, uh, that all of those are opportunities for discipleship in the life of a man. And we ought to go disciple him where he is. Jesus did not say, go into all the world and make disciples of every man willing to get up at 6 a.m. on Friday morning and come to your Bible study. Right? He said, go into the world and make disciples. And so we need to disciple them right where they are. Okay, we have a question. We're talking about discipleship and the all-inclusive ministry to men. And I see here it says the number of men in my church. And I'm thinking, well, we can make that even more all-inclusive because I'm all about discipleship. I'm always talking to people about how great my church is and thinking of ways that I can invite them to the church. So if we change that instead of the number of men in my church to the number of men in my church plus those that we need to be inviting, then that would be an even bigger number. Yeah, that's great. So not only is it the number of men in your church, but it's the number of men that are connected to your church by association or by relationships. And that's going to be a very powerful tool for you to start thinking about as you try to get this no man left behind model worked into the lives and hearts of other men in your church, other men who are leaders who become your allies. They're going to start thinking about, okay, there's guys at my office that I'm the only connection to, to Christ in our church that they have. There's those guys that I go on that annual deer hunting trip on that land that we lease for a week. You know, Five of those guys don't go to church anywhere. 
that's a great opportunity that our church has to maybe touch some men's lives. And so absolutely, we ought to be thinking even more than just the men who are there now, but the men that we would want to reach as well through our ministry. And so how does this help you? Well, it solves a number of problems that most churches have in their ministry to men, especially if they have the old men's ministry model. One of the problems that it solves is an us versus them mentality, an us versus them mentality. Uh, you know, if you go to a typical church with a men's ministry, you're going to have all kinds of committed men who don't consider themselves to be a part of it. We used to hear this all the time from leaders. Fortunately, not so much anymore, but we used to hear all the time, oh, the deacons in our church, you know, they just don't care anything about men's ministry. They never come to our weekly breakfast, you know. Meanwhile, the deacon was out Friday night, you know, at 1130 at night putting a hot water heater in a single mother's house. And so he didn't get up at Saturday at 7 to come to your breakfast. Somehow he's not part of your men's ministry? I mean, this is exactly the kind of man we want to produce. The, the, the men who teach youth Sunday school, the guys who help out in the nursery, the, the coaches of our, of our upwards basketball, the men who, who, who play in the praise band who, or who work the audiovisual equipment, all these guys in a typical church don't feel like they're part of the men's ministry. That's ridiculous. You know, they're part of what God is doing in and through the men of our church. And so when we have an all-inclusive mentality, all of a sudden, we can tell those guys, we appreciate you as a man in this church serving Christ through the audiovisual team, or by working in the nursery, or by coaching sports, or by teaching a, a co-ed Sunday school class, or whatever the case may be. They're all part of what God is doing through the ministry of men in our church. And so it gets rid of this us versus them mentality. The other thing it does is it, it gets rid of turf battles. Um, you've probably seen churches before where there are competing efforts that are going on, and uh, particularly if something new is going to get started, right? And so you're going to start something new in October, and wait a minute, we've been doing this thing in November for 14 years, you know? Why, why are you going to do that? Well, uh, really, a lot of times, sometimes th those things aren't necessary. But the, the perspective of each of those individual ministries is, oh, this is my thing. This is part of the women's ministry, or this is part of the children's ministry, or this is part of the men's ministry. And so the other people think, well, we've got to do something of our own. I was with a church that asked me to come by for lunch, and I, I met with them, and, and they told me about uh, the idea that they wanted to do an evangelistic outreach for men. And they asked me, what did I see working around the country? And I said, well, tell me what you all are doing now that, that reaches men who do, don't have a relationship with Christ. And they said, well, our men's ministry doesn't do anything. That's why we asked you the question. We want to le learn what to do. And I said, no, not your men's ministry. What's your church doing now that is touching men who don't have a relationship with Christ? Do you have a preschool? Do you have sports? Do you, I mean, what are you doing? And so they listed all kinds of things, a big Easter presentation and just lots of things. And finally, somebody said, oh, I guess, you know, the family festival is probably the biggest thing we do. And I said, well, tell me about that. And they pointed to some land out the window across the street that they owned. And, and they said that every fall they set that thing up. It's almost like a county fair. And I said, well, how many people came to that last year? And uh, they said, oh, something like 12,000 people came to it over a week. I'm thinking 12,000 people. I said, well, how many of those men do you think are unchurched? And so they went through and they did the math. Okay, how many kids? How many moms without dads? I mean, they did all that stuff. The lowest number they came up with was about 600. Okay, they guessed that they were, in, they, they were having a, uh, interactions with 600 men who had no relationship with Christ. And I said to them, okay, now what could you as a men's ministry do that would get 600 unchurched men to show up at your church? They just looked at me. We're like, well, no sports guy is going to do it. No NASCAR guy is going to do it. Uh, maybe if we gave out $100 bills and advertised that we were going to do that, we might get 600 guys to come by and at least pick one up, you know. But that's probably about it. And so I said, okay, so what you're telling me, how I said, how many volunteers are involved with this family festival? And they said, we're not sure, but we think it's like 400 or more. And I said, okay, you've got 400 people in your church handing you 600 unchurched men right there, ready for you to interact with, and you want to start your own evangelistic outreach that's going to distract leaders in your church, that's going to take time, effort, and energy, and you already know it's guaranteed not to be as effective because there's no way you're going to get 600 guys there. 
Why would you want to do this? Why don't you get behind the family festival, support them, rent one of those, you know, ring the bell with a sledgehammer things or whatever, set it up, give prizes to the guys, have your men there, meeting them, offering them next steps to engage in the life of your church. Take advantage of what God is already using rather than creating something new that ends up distracting other leaders and other resources in your church. And so all of a sudden, these comp competing ministries see you coming alongside them, and they get excited. We recognized at our church that um, the evening that the, the vacation Bible school, when the kids would sing for their families, that was probably our greatest men's ministry outreach event of the whole year. Because we looked around and we said, you know, we probably have 35, 40 unchurched men sitting in our church building to watch their kids. And with a church our size, there's probably nothing else we could do on one night to connect with that many guys. And yet no one had ever seen it as a men's ministry activity because it was children's, right? Family ministry. And when we started to think about this all-inclusive concept, we realized, you know what? We need to be there. We need to be meeting these guys. And so one year we set up a, a putting green outside, and we had the, the dads invited to come and putt. And if they made the putt, you know, they got some prize or something. And, and we were advertising a golf tournament that was coming up, and we were giving them some other next steps. There was a parenting seminar or class that was going to happen or whatever the case may be. And, yeah, not everybody was going to take advantage of it, but we were building on what the leaders of that vacation Bible school ministry had done, and we were trying to use what God was already blessing in the life of our church to make it even more effective for men. And that's what this all-inclusive uh, uh, process can help you with. Another thing it does is it puts you on the pastor's team. Now, a lot of senior pastors um, are very hesitant about the idea of men's ministry. And uh, we, sometimes you hear motives, bad motives ascribed to that. You know, they're scared or, you know, whatever. Or, uh, they don't care about men. I mean, all these things. I think a lot of it has to do with this concept that we're talking about right now. The pastor can't really say this because he hasn't ever formulated it. Maybe they haven't ever formulated it exactly this way. But think about what we're saying in a traditional vision of, of men's ministry, version of men's ministry. We're saying, pastor, what we want you to do is we want you to do men's evangelism, we want you to do men's service projects. We want you to do men's worship. We want you to do men's small groups. We want you to do men's teaching. We want you to do men's retreats. We want you to do men's mission trips, okay? We want you to do men's recreation and fellowship, all right? Well, what are all those things? That's another church. I mean, I'm already doing all those things, and men are already involved in all of them through what I normally do. I mean, all, the only thing you're subtracting is marrying people and burying people. You just gave me twice as much stuff to do, and I'm already doing it now, and guys are already here. So why do I have to do all that over there when it tends to not work as like it's supposed to anyway, right? And so all, all of a sudden, if you can take an all-inclusive perspective, you can find your pastor's passion, and you can say, Pastor, you've got guys that are connecting with your vision for ministry in our community. And they're working with their families. They're working with their wives. They're involved in this family ministry service and all these things that you've started. We want to help you make those even more effective for the men that are involved. Do you hear the difference? Not, we want to start a men's only service ministry. Okay, red flag, red flag, red flag. Wait a minute, I'm having trouble staffing the one I have now. I don't have enough leaders. I don't have enough involvement. And you're saying you want to do something else. No, that's not what we're saying. Pastor, we want, to, we want to help make what you're already doing more effective for the guys that are involved in it. Um, and so whatever their passion is, it puts you on their team. And so you can actually get some of those leaders that can begin to understand, look, this is maybe our only shot to connect with these men. And so if it's educational opportunities, maybe you get a man in every one of your co-ed classes. And that man sees himself his responsibility is to look around and see, how are these guys doing? Are they being discipled in this class? Do I need to go to breakfast with somebody? Do I need to uh, pray for somebody? Do I need to get together and share? Do, do my wife and I need to invite a couple over? Because I want to make sure this class is being effective in the lives of these men. The same thing on the worship team. The same thing with the, the ushers. 
You know, that, that there's, a, there's a head usher that says, look, some of these guys, parking lot attendants, okay? You know why guys work in the parking lot? Because they don't want to stand around inside having to shake people's hands and look awkward and, you know, maybe sing a song, whatever. If I'm out in the parking lot, I get the cool vest and the technology, okay? And so I'm out there. I can actually do something, right? So now you have the head parking lot guy, and you say, look, when, when the cars aren't coming by, we have a little scripture verse on this card and a prayer request from the pastor. And what we're asking is, would you pray about this request today in between, you know, when it's not busy and there's no cars in coming in or whatever? Well, some of those guys have never prayed for your pastor. They've never prayed for your church in, in their entire life. And yet now you're modeling and you're using what they're already involved in as being a parking lot worker. You're using that to help them move forward in their discipleship process. See? And so the final thing that this really does for us when we start thinking about the wide, deep continuum and this whole process of discipleship is it takes the pressure off, okay? Because all of a sudden, I don't have to do a men's ministry, a bang-up, fantastic.